right, so I uh, welcome everybody to um, uh, Making Sense of Verso. So I realized after I named this program that who knows what Verso is unless you work here, but Verso is the name of our catalog. And that's the name that the company which provides the software that we use gave it. Um, so essentially what we're talking about today is making sense of the catalog. And um, we changed our cataloging systems in uh, the very end of April. So for many years we used a system called Follett Destiny, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And that um, we kept that for many, many years. Um, but for a variety of reasons, the library really needs to update to something which was better suited for a public library. And uh, we hoped uh, 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 more useful in certain ways for our patrons. So we'll see. Uh, we've certainly been answering a lot of questions. And um, something like this, we hope to uh, uh, answer more questions as well. Um, so my name is Steve Picasso. I'm the head circulation librarian here. Um, I provided my contact information there up on the screen, and you're more than welcome to contact me at any point if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer. I've answered a lot of questions through email or phone, done it both, so um, uh, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like. Um, so. Would the first time that you access, oh, I'm sorry, let me uh, start with something else real quick. So the, the catalog is web-based, so you would be accessing it through the internet. And um, one thing which is a little different from our old system is um, you can get to it from any internet browser that you use with the exception of Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer um, is just getting a bit old now, and Microsoft is phasing it out. So when the company made Verso, they chose not to make it compatible with Internet Explorer because Microsoft has a new web browser now. So if you're using Internet Explorer, which is the lighter colored E, it actually won't work for you. And I'll show you what happens. Um, you'll actually just get a blank screen. Um, so if you've seen this, if you've tried to get to the catalog and you just get a totally blank screen like this, it might be because you're using Internet Explorer. Now, to make things complicated, Microsoft didn't change, make their new browser something very different sounding. They called it Microsoft Edge, and it also has an E symbol, but it's a slightly darker E. So it's this one down here. Now, where, where did you say? How can you tell if you've got Internet Explorer? Well, it's hard to. I mean, you, if you have like it down here in your um, uh, in your uh, taskbar down here, uh -huh. if you hover your mouse over it and just leave it there, it will you know come up okay. with the words. When you're so. on my phone, what I've got. Yeah, and that's the other thing too. Get to the catalog. A lot of folks don't pay much attention. You know, you have probably have one browser, if it's a phone or if it's a, um, a computer, you probably just have one browser, and it works for pretty much everything. But that is just one um, uh, uh, slight problem with accessing the catalog, is you can't do it through Internet Explorer. Um, so today I'm going to be using Google Chrome. Uh, Google Chrome is available for any uh, computer as well as any smartphone or tablet as well. It tends to work really well with the catalog, but like I said, the catalog will work on any browser with the exception of my uh, Internet Explorer. Okay. So I'm starting here at the library's website, which is kelloghubbard.org. And on your handout here, that's the first, very first step. Go to www.kelloghubbard.org. Um, you can choose, as we get further along, to make a bookmark that's specifically for the catalog, but the first time you go into the catalog, you want to start at kelloghubbard.org, and if you choose not to use a bookmark or you, know, you just don't want to do that sort of thing, you can always start from kelloghubbard.org. And you'll see that there's uh, two catalog-related options on the screen. There's search our catalog, which is uh, pretty self-explanatory, and then there's login as well. And both of those options take you to the exact same place, which is the catalog. The only reason we offered both is that we used to have 
um, old login option on our website for the old catalog. We wanted to kind of continue that so people who are used to clicking login could still click login. And then we thought the search our catalog just sort of um, was a bit more direct. It kind of, the language made more sense. So either of those buttons will take you to the catalog. And when you click on them, it'll open a totally new tab for you. And um, this is what the catalog looks like. Now I'm going to go through the whole login process, so how you can find your account, how you can uh, see what you have checked out, what you have on reserve, if you want to renew something, all of that stuff. But I want to stop here real quick just to say if all that you want to do is just search the catalog, you just want to see, I wonder if the library has such and such a book. You don't have to log in to find that information out. You can just search right here, right now, right at the top here. And um, this is also how you'll find the computers in the library that are um, always log always have the catalog on their screen. This is what they look like. Yeah. And uh, so you, when you're in the library, you certainly don't have to log in. You can just type in something and um, find out if we have it. So um, let me go through the steps for logging in. So you've clicked either log in or go to the catalog, and here you are at the catalog. And you'll see here, hello, please log in, and you'll click on that. Now, um, it brings up this window here, and uh, it very nicely tells you you're already ready to go with the Kellogg Covered Library. You don't have to choose anything in that top uh, box there. But this first line doesn't say anything, so um, which is sort of just a strange little quirk of the system. But what it is is this the username line. And um, so if you had used Follett Destiny, if you would used our old catalog, you had probably set up a login where you made a username for yourself. Maybe it was your first name or whatever you wanted to use. You could pick whatever you want. With this system, none of that information transferred over. So if you had an old login, unfortunately, you've got to start from the beginning. And starting from the beginning means using your library card number as your username. That's, that's one of the key bullet points I want to stress today. <laughs> Use, the library card number is your username. So I've got a library card and I'm going I'm to um, type it in here. And on the card itself, there seems to be some spaces in between some of the numbers. I'm going to put it in without any spaces. I'm just, it's a 14-digit number, starts with a 2. I'm going to put it in without any spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I've typed in my username. Now for the password, everybody starts with the default password. So again, your password didn't transfer over from the old system. Everybody starts with a default password, and it's listed here on your handout under number three. It's KHL802, and KHL is lowercase. Um, so that's your starting password right here. When you type it in, it won't show that. It will just show the dots. Um, but that's what you're looking for. Now, at this point, and this is your choice, you can click on this Remember Me box, and it will remember you so that the next time you click, uh, you go to the catalog, it will um, provide you with your username and password so you don't have to type it in again. Even before changing the password? Well, that's the thing. So if you're going, if you're planning to change your password, you wouldn't want to do that right now. And if you're planning on changing your username, you wouldn't want to do that right now. You also wouldn't want to do that on a public computer, obviously, if someone else is using the computer. And if you're in a household where multiple people have different library cards and you're all trying to log in to see your stuff, probably wouldn't want to do that because, you know, you'd only be logging in as one person. So. Uh, this happens to be a public computer. I'm not going to click Remember Me, but if I did, um, then that would save my information. Um, you might also get a window that comes up from your browser, and it will say, do you want to remember this, your login information for this website? And if you did, you would say yes. Um, so it would be another way to remember your username and password. So when I click Submit, I know that I was successful because it says hello. Now in this case, this is sort of a, a, a um, test account, so it has a weird name of active, but for your personal account, it would say hello and then your first name. 
Um, so that's what uh, it's telling me here. It's saying hello, and then uh, it's saying your account. So that your account there, that's your main menu. Anything about your account is listed under that where it says your account. So if you click on that, it brings up your main menu. And there's a bunch of things on here which are useful. So if I click on items out, I can see what I have checked out. And it will tell me a due date for each of these items. It will, if it were overdue, it would um, tell me how much fines I would be charged for after I return these items. It tells me when I took the item out, and um, it also tells me the basic information about the book, the title, the author, and the call number. If I wanted to renew, I could click Renew All. Now, in this case, I just happened to check these out not that long ago, so um, I can't renew a book that I checked out today. But if these were things that I checked out yesterday and I wanted to renew them, there would be a renew item here, uh, a little button that would say renew item. And that would just be the difference. If I click renew all, it's going to do all of them. If, the, if I click the single button, it would just renew the one item, depending on what I wanted. Um, you may get a message that the item was not able to renew. And unfortunately, the system's not going to give you a lot of details about it. But it could be one of a number of reasons. One would be if somebody else has the item on hold. If somebody else has the item on hold, it just won't let you do it. Um, the other would be if you've already renewed the item to the maximum number of times. So books, for example, can renew twice. So if you've already renewed them twice and you click on it again, it's going to say, I can't do it. And then um, the less likely scenario is that your account has expired. And this is sort of a weird thing. Um, uh, uh, other libraries do this too, and I wish we had different language for this, but all that means is that once a year, we have to confirm with each patron that you're still at the same address and that your contact information hasn't changed. And we do that for two reasons. One is we need to confirm the contact information so that if we ever need to get in touch with you to say, hey, your hold's ready, or um, uh, something like that, we want to make sure we can get in touch with you. And then the other reason is every year we have to report to our member towns how many people are using the library from East Montpelier and from Middlesex and et cetera like that. So we need to have that information as up to date as possible every year. So the result, unfortunately, for patrons means that the accounts ex do expire every year. So even though um, if you live in the member towns, you're not paying any money for an account, it still will expire once a year. So it could be that situation too. And then the final reason you wouldn't be able to renew something is if either your fines were over the maximum of $10, your total fines, or if you hadn't returned a book, an overdue book, in over a month, and then you would be billed for that book, in that case your account would be blocked and you wouldn't be able to renew. But those are the less likely scenarios. The more likely scenario is that just somebody has the book on hold. You can always give us a call or email if you want to renew something and you can, and we can provide you the details, and you know, uh, if, particularly if you think that there's some sort of mistake that has happened. And, you know, oh, I've only renewed that once, you know, why can't I renew it again, that sort of thing. Okay, so if I go back into my menu here, I can also look at the items I have on hold. Now, in this case, um, I have one item on hold, and I place the uh, item on hold today, and I'm the first person in the queue, which means I'll be the first person to get this item. And now this is the thing which kind of trips people up a lot. It will expire one year from today. And what that means is if, if there were just 100 people on hold for this book and one whole year had passed and my name hadn't come up on the list, then the hold will just expire. Because the system is just assuming that after a year I wouldn't want to read it. Um, but note that it's one year from today. I put the reserve. Uh, 10 21 2019 and it expires 10 21 2020 a lot of people see that and think it's the same year and like well is it going to expire at the end of the day and it's not it's a whole year you have a whole year um, and you know I can tell you it's never going to expire You're, you'll get the book before the year is up um, and then you can also um, cancel your hold if you if you decided you no longer wanted it you could cancel your and suspend hold would be if you um, uh, 
uh, didn't need it right now, but you didn't want to take your name off the list completely because later on you'll want it again, that sort of thing, um, if that were, were ever pertinent to you. Um, so uh, lost item would just be if you had lost an item and paid for it, it would be listed there. Checkout history, this system does not record your checkout history by default. Um, if you want it to, you can click activate history or you can ask us at the desk or you can call us to do that. Um, but by default, the system is not going to record your checkout history. If, it, if, if I had activated the history for this particular account, I, it would show what I had checked out and then I could even break it down by year and all that kind of information. Um, but by default, it's not going to. This is, a diff, this is a big change from our old system, but the old system was the opposite. By default, it did record everybody's information um, and then you had to opt out of it. Now it's the opposite. Now you have to opt in. So it's only the history since you had this new system? Exactly. It doesn't go back. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And in fact, it's actually the history from the moment you activate it. Right. Yep. Okay. Does that make sense? Can you click on that activate mm -hmm. history? Sure. Yeah. And then it just gives you a little warning that you're... And then, um, in this case, I mean, I only started checking things out on this card today. Um, so it doesn't actually have any history because, like I said, I, it, I, I checked things out or before I activated the, but if I were to go now and check something out, it would show up. Does that make sense? Or if I were to come in tomorrow and check something out, then it would show up. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so active alerts, um, this is just how we know, uh, oh, um, Actually, I apologize, I don't want to go into that. That's actually not something that would be relevant. Um, and then fines would show if you had any uh, fines in your account. So this is a little bit different from the check out page. On the items checked out page, if you had something that was overdue, it would show you how much fines will be added to your account once those items are checked in. This is sort of your running balance. So this is what's already on your card. If I had previously checked something out, kept it longer past its due date, and then returned it, it would show like 25 cents or whatever it might be. Um, so this, if you're wondering if you have current fines in your account, that's what that would show. Okay, great. Any questions about any of that stuff? Or feel free to ask questions at any time, by the way. Um, so, so that's all the stuff that you'll uh, particularly the, the reserve uh, renewals with items out and looking at your holds and that sort of stuff. Those are the most common things that you'll be uh, looking at. Um, so the other thing that I want to show you is your profile here. So under your settings in your profile here, um, what you see is the place where you can change your password and where you can enter a nickname. And let me explain what that means. So this is also written down here on the second portion of the handout. So, like I was saying before, everybody starts with the default password of KHL802. Um, obviously, since everybody's sharing that password and it's not secretive, you would like, likely want to change that. So what you would do is you would just click here and you would type whatever you want. It doesn't have to, it's not character limited. It's, you don't have to have a certain number of numbers or, uh, anything like that. You can whatever you want, whatever works for you. And you change it and then you click save. And then your other option is if you don't like having your username be your 14 digit library card number, you can go to the bottom of the page and you can type something into nickname and that will essentially give you another username. That's basically what it's doing. Your username can always be your 14 digit library card number or you can also add an additional nickname. Now I say all this with the major caveat that is that those two functions, changing your password and adding a nickname, are not currently working. They were working for a long time, from April until about a week ago, and then they stopped working, and I'm hoping that very soon they'll be working again. I've been in contact with the folks who run um, the software, and um, they're aware that it's not working and they're trying to figure it out. So we can't, we can't um, 
change our password right now? Not as of that right way, now. So we'd have to use this. Yes. Okay. But uh, like I said, hopefully very very soon <laughs> this will fun this will function properly, and and I've seen it function properly for months, so yeah. I it definitely does work. Okay. Um, but that's where you would change your password, and if you wanted a different username, essentially, mm -hmm. you can use that nickname field. Okay. All right. So let's see where we are. All right. Um, so now let's talk about um, actually using the catalog itself as a some, to, to find out what's in the library. Mm -hmm. um, so this up at the very top of the screen, this, here. this up here at the very top of the screen is where you do your searching. And um, so let me just kind of run through what these different things are. Here it says all headings. In most other uh, search engines that you're going to be using, let's say you're on Amazon or even probably another library catalog, that would probably say keyword, as in it's just going to search everything for that particular word. In this particular system, they say all headings. Um, but that's, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking essentially the equivalent of a keyword search. So if I type something in here, like New York, it's going to search every item in this building that might say the word New York in it, and it's probably going to give you lots and lots of results. And um, now there might be a situation, in fact, there's probably lots of situations where that's useful for you. So I got you 42, know, 42, 000, 000. So Yeah. And um, so there's a lot probably, you know, particularly if you're looking for something very specific, like a word or a place name or something that's not going to come up in a lot of item records that could be useful for you. And I certainly do a lot of all heading or keyword searches at the desk, depending on what people are asking for. So that's the default. It's going to default to that. But I can change it so that I can just search for an author, I can just search for a title, I can just search for a subject. There's also all these other things, but those are the three things I'm going to talk about tonight. Because I think those are the most useful and the most obvious. If you misspell something, does it figure that out or it won't give it? It's so, so this is an interesting feature of this system as opposed to our old system. Mm -hmm. This system unfortunately doesn't have that Google function where it says, did you mean such yeah. and such? Unfortunately, it doesn't have that. Yeah. What it does have is it will suggest things. So if you start typing yeah. something and it thinks it knows what it might be, yeah. it will say, it will kind of provide something underneath that white box that, you know, yeah. sort of like finish it for you. Now, one of the interesting things about that is even if it suggests something, that doesn't mean that it's here in this building. It might mean that another library somewhere else has it. Oh. So that's sort of a bit of a double-edged sword with that, where it's nice to have that additional thing because particularly if you're not certain 100% about the spelling, it might provide you with the spelling or something like that. But um, it, it doesn't 100% mean that it's in this building. So you might say, oh, great, yes, that was what I wanted. And then you click on it, and it says, no results found. And you're, well, what does that mean? Why, why would it suggest something that it doesn't have? But that's why. Because essentially what it's doing is it's um, that suggestion, those suggestions that it's getting, it's pulling from all the libraries that use this system. But naturally, we only have this uh, uh, website set up to only look at the Kellogg covered library. So that's sort of like the, the kind of strange situation. Mm -hmm. so, so just, you know, the, those suggestions are great and I like using them myself. Just kind of be aware that um, um, ultimately you're only searching the Kellogg covered library in this. So um, those suggestions might always get you a result. Um, okay. And what about if I type just half a word? So it will give me suggestions? If you just type half a word, it depends on the word. Um, I mean, I can just like try something. Like if I start, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on what it is that, I'm not really sure how far you have to go before it starts giving you suggestions. Um, and like I said, I, I, that's kind of one of the things where, um, well, I'll talk about search strategies in here too. 
So like if you're not 100% certain what the full title is or something like that, we can talk about that too. So like see up there for uh, one of the, under there, the titles of things. Yeah. Like one says Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. So if you typed in, say Fahrenheit 401, what would happen? Would it just say, no, don't have it? Or would it suggest something, the right one? It's probably gonna say nothing, like as in no results, um, but we can test it. Oh, we well, did get it. So there you go. Oh, okay. But actually, this is sort of an interesting question, which is, is it pulling it because of the word Fahrenheit, or is it pulling it be, you know, so let's just, this, let's experiment here, and let's just search Fahrenheit. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is the other thing about um, these searches. So um, if I put in a two or three or however many words search, it's searching each individual word. Um, which is both a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how specific you want to be. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about if you really know exactly what the title is or exactly what the author's name is, we can talk about how to specifically just search that. Yeah. But in that case, like you could have the number wrong but have that first word right and still yeah. get the result because it's searching for each, each item, each word or, or in, in the search. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, like, you know, um, depending, you can have sort of like almost the right title and still get something. Um, all right. So for a title search, now I, let's say I know specifically that I'm looking for a book called New York Burning. And if I do a title search, and in this case, I only get one result. We only have one book that has those three exact words. And in this case, it has a longer title but I got exactly what I wanted. Now, uh, which is great. Now let's say I couldn't remember the title, but I remember the author. I can do it like that. I can do first name, then last name. And in this case, we have multiple books by that particular author, but here it is again, so I found it. Mm -hmm. And then just sort of depending what you might be used to in terms of looking at library catalogs, you can also do the inverse where you can put the last name and then the first name and you'll get the exact same results. You have to put the comma in there? Yeah, if you're doing it that way, but like you can also yep. just do the normal way with yeah. your first name right. and then last name, but you'll get the exact same results. It can tell what you're looking for. Well, if you for. say you remembered the last name, but mm -hmm. you couldn't remember yeah. the first name, or maybe you just remembered the first letter. Yeah, so, so like, um, I can do that, and it should give me the same results. Let's see. Oh, that didn't work. But Laporte, just, just the last name will. So just the last name will definitely get me the results. Now, obviously, there might be a situation where this happens to be a, not a super common last name. Right. But if it's, you know, Smith, that's not going to be as, <laughs> as helpful to you. So, um... So and what about name and initial? Does it work? So we just tried name and first initial and that didn't work. Um, so what I, and let me show you subject and then we'll kind of talk about sort of building searches with, with uh, different pieces. Um, so if, let's say I couldn't remember the author's name and I couldn't remember um, the title, but I remember that it's a book about a slave revolt in New York City. If I do subject search and then I do something like that, and there it is, mm -hmm. I can find the book. Subject searching is, I find, super helpful. However, I should mention, the subjects are determined by the Library of Congress, meaning that there's a very specific subject for each thing. Um, so there's, I'll show you here. The subjects are listed in the, in the catalog record. And in this case, there's a specific subject for slave revolts in New York. So um, for something like that, um, I'm likely to get it. But you know, if you're looking for, say, like a medical thing, and but you put in a slightly different word for the exact same medical condition or whatever it might be, if it's not the official subject language, mm -hmm. it's not probably not going to get it. So the subject search is good and bad. I like to use them a lot, actually, particularly as somebody um, 
uh, you know, it says, I'm just looking for a book on so-and-so. I find them really helpful and they can really lead you to other books on the same subject, that sort of stuff. But um, so the, 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 there's times when a subject search is helpful and there's times when you just want to wade into the, the vastness of a all headings or keyword search because we are going to get potentially thousands of results. So, so let's talk about what if, what if I know only pieces of the various things. So I know the title has the word New York in it. And I know the author's first name is Jill. And I know that it's about a slavery. So I'm going to do all heading, and I'm just going to put all that stuff in there. And um, let's see if we get anything. And there it came up. So um, the, if, if you know just pieces, the all heading can be good, particularly the more information you can give to it, because the all heading can also bring up thousands and thousands of results if it's something kind of vague. Um, the other way you could do that is you, there's this advanced button up here, and the advanced button, it's essentially another way to type that same information in. So if you click on it, it just gives you boxes like this. So I can type in New York here, and I can specifically tell it, I know that's in the title, and then I can tell it Jill, and then I know that's in the author. But again, you certainly don't have to do this if you don't want to. But you can do the much simpler, just use the one big yeah. box up here. Yeah. But, but all this is available to you. And then um, some people are used to, this is sort of um, when library catalogs first went electric, or <laughs> which is a weird thing to say, but when, when, when they transitioned from um, uh, physical card catalogs to electronic catalogs, this thing was, this type of thing was very common, and it was um, called Boolean searching, and so uh, you might be familiar with this sort of searching from that, but if you're not, I would just say use the one big box in the top, but this is sort of what, what library, early library catalog searching used to look like. Um, okay. So, let's do a really general search, and where we get thousands of results, and then we'll say, okay, so let's say I just do a really general search and I get thousands of results, but the way that I want to pare this down is I don't want books, and I don't want movies, I specifically want audiobooks. On the, le on the side of the screen here, you have all these different options. So one of them is material type. And I can open this up by just clicking on that. And now I can say I only want to look at the audiobooks that came up in this search. So I can click that, and it will update my search results. And now all that it's showing although I see a, book, a couple books in there, and I don't know why, um, but is audiobooks here. Um, so sometimes, you know, that's specifically what you want. You just want an audiobook, and that's a way to do that. Um, and there's a whole lot of other ways you can pare down what your search results are, depending on what you want. You know, you can, in this case, I did a general keyword search, um, but I could say, well, I know it's a really new book, I know it was published within you know the past five years. I could type in 2014 to 2019. And now I'm only looking at books that were published in those five years. Mm -hmm. And I actually didn't get that seems wrong. But um, and then um, location is handy if you were specifically looking for a children's book versus an adult book. I could say, well, I only want to look at the children's picture books about New York, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So there's all these different options down here that you can, some of these are going to be more useful, and some of these are going to mean nothing. And so, but I think the more useful ones like material type, uh, location, are going to be kind of more obvious. And the other, other very useful one is way up at the top here is available. So this would be, if you want to see, can I go into the library today and check this out? Um, you would do that, and anything that was checked out would, wouldn't show. 
Um, so depending on you know what exactly you're looking for. Now, as you add these limiters, you'll see that they they show up here on the screen. So I've add, I'm only looking at picture books, and I'm only looking at ones that are available right now that fall under this search of New York. All right. Okay. And and uh, I should mention, by the way, for the subjects, it gives you a list of subjects here too. So which it, when the subjects are nice too, because um, you're going to see, you know, these these are going to be like humorous stories about New York and that sort of stuff. Now, um, let's say you've been spending 10 minutes doing all sorts of different searches, and um, you get to a point where you want to say, well, wait a minute, you know, that first search I did, I saw something that I actually now that I think what I am interested in. If I click on search history here, I can look at what I've searched for in the past. So I can say, oh, yeah, way back here, I searched for this book, Flawed Giant. I want to do that again. And then there I've done it again. So and that's just sort of a handy way to look back at what you've been look, searching for in the past. Um, OK, great. So uh, any questions about actually searching for a book or trying to find what you're looking for, um, that sort of thing? OK, so let's say I've done a search here. and. Um, I want this book, this particular book. Now, um, in this case, I'll, I'll just kind of go through the different information in this box. So obviously, the title is shown at the top. The author is shown underneath it. It's telling me the format right here. In this case, it's just a book. If it were um, an audio book, it would say so. And if it were a movie, it would say so. Um, it would say video in that case, um, but this is just a book and it's telling me that one of one is available So that means the library owns one copy and it's available meaning it's not checked out if it said zero of one available That would mean it's been checked out now um, These buttons down here this one with the finger is place a hold So if I were planning to come to the library tomorrow, but I want to make sure this book was here for me I could say place a hold and then a librarian would go take it from the stacks and put it behind the desk under your name so that uh, you could get it. I could also say save to your list. So let's say um, I don't have the time to read this right now, but I want to put it on a list of things I want to read later. I can make a list of things that I want to read later. Then there's this view details. And the view details is going to show me all the information that this library has on this book. So I could click on that and I could see its subjects. I could see um, what other books are near it. Sometimes that's helpful as sort of like a shelf browse. Like I'm looking for books on this sort of topic. What other books does the library have on that? And sometimes just looking at what else is near it on the shelf can be really helpful. So trying to duplicate that experience of being physically here in the library and doing a little shelf browsing, that sort of thing. And then show location. And this is really important. Show location is really important. I want to actually know the call number of the book so I can go to the shelf and find it. And that's where you find that information. And that's something that I wish this system were better at. And a lot of times people will be in the library looking up something on the catalog and say, but where is it? It doesn't tell me where it is so I can go find it in the building. And that's what you want. And this is the information specifically you want right here under call number. This location here, see how it says desk to be reviewed? That's actually wrong. There's a lot of things that say desks to be reviewed. We're trying to fix that. There's just a huge backlog of fixing that sort of information. Um, but this is always correct, right here in the middle, call number. That's, that's the physical location of the book in the building. Um, the barcode, each, each, each library book has a specific barcode so we can check it out and know what it is. And then the SMS is actually if you want to receive a text message to your phone with the call number. And if you wanted that, so you could walk away from the computer and you know have that, you know, as opposed to writing it down or whatever. You know, some people like that sort of thing. And if this were a giant, you know, massive city public library where you would have to go up three flights and then over to the next building or whatever, that might be helpful because you're walking far away from the computer or whatever. And then status is obviously very important. It's saying it's available. Um, okay. 
So let's look at view details. You can always view details. Let me, let me show you. You can click on that um, I, the letter I, and view details, or you can just click on the cover and it will take you to the same information. Um, and uh, so here's all that information that we looked at in the where to find it. It shows up. All the details about the book, so your author, your title, edition, publisher, uh, all this information, notes about it, which kind of usually notes are going to give you kind of a um, synopsis, uh, your subjects, all that information. More information about the book in terms of a summary, some information about the author. This, all this information varies book by book. Some, some books have tons of information like this, other books don't. Depends on how it was cataloged, who cataloged it, all that sort of stuff. And then here's the shelf browse. So I can see this book falls within this area on the shelf. So these are other books, and I can see this is a book about um, colonial America. So I see other books about colonial America right there. Mm -hmm. And that's handy if I'm you know, doing a research, something researching that era, I can see what other books the library has on that. Now, just like um, I can, I can. There's a place hold option on this screen as well, and I can choose that. And then there's also an add this item to your list on this screen as well, and I can choose that. And there's also email this item, and I can choose that. And that's kind of the same thing as the text. It's just going to email you with information if you wanted that for whatever reason. So if it's on hold. Mm -hmm. Is it on there indefinitely on hold, or does do, are you expected to come in and get that book within a certain amount of time? Yeah, sure. So let me let me show you that. So I know for sure I want this book, and I'm going to click place a hold. And basically, it's just going to ask me to confirm this. So it's it's telling me the information about the book, and it's giving me this place a hold option here. Now, one thing that this system can do that the old system could not do is let's say I'm I need this for a book club. And the book club is reading this as its December book. Well, I don't want to read it quite yet. I could say, I don't need this until December. And I can say, I don't need it until December 1st. And then if I say place hold, what it's going to tell the library is, don't hold this yet. Wait until December 1st. Whether or not this is useful to people, I don't know. But this is a new function that this, this particular catalog has at the old but in this case, I want this right now. And what if somebody wants to get it in November? Then they can. They're not oh, going to be stopped. It's kind of on hold. Yeah. So essentially, all that that does is it delays telling us, the librarians, to go get the book and put it on hold for you until December 1st. Mm -hmm. That's all that, that does. But you know, sometimes you're looking at books and then you, know, you want to plan this stuff ahead of time and all that stuff. So that's an option for you. Um, but OK, so I want this book right now. Uh, so I'm actually going to just clear all this out, leave it blank, and I'm going to say place a hold. So I place the hold, and what's going to happen is the librarians at the desk are going to get a message that says, I have placed, you know, this particular patron has placed a hold for this book, and then they'll go to the shelf and they'll get it, and then they'll tell the computer, I've gotten this book for this particular person. Once they tell the computer that, you'll get an email, and the email will say, this book's ready for you. So um, so if you're at home and you place some holds on some items, those items are going to be coming to you soon, but you actually will get the email when it's confirmed that it's sitting on the shelf behind the desk with your name on it, and you can come get it right now. At this particular library, we hold things for four business days for and that should be that in the email that you get from the library, it will say this hold will expire on and it will be like five days from now. Okay. And then so you have four business days to come get it. If you're ever in a situation where you know you're just can't do it in four days, you need an extra day, you can always call us and we can see if we can make an exception depending on if other people are waiting for the book and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering if I want that book on December first. So would it be sitting all November on that back shelf? No, nope, it's going to stay in the regular stacks for anybody else to check out. And they can check it out all November. And then what happens on, on December 1st, the librarians are going to get the notice, go pull this book for Ulster or whoever. You know. And if somebody didn't return it on time? Well, in that case, then it's going to wait. 
you know, you're, it's 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 going to show as a reserve that you have that's not available. So if we didn't get it on that December. Class, In that case, yes. if someone had it checked out, no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like I said, whether or not that's useful to people, I don't know. But that, I did want to point that out as a as a um, uh, as a feature. So okay, so this book is in the building. So um, probably soon, when the librarians at the desk will go and pull it from the shelf, and then they'll send me an email to say this book's ready. But what, what if I wanted a book that's currently checked out? And then I did some research. I found out that this book is checked out. And let's say I want this book. I'm going to place it on hold. I can see zero one available is checked out. So I am going to place on hold. Now in this case, it's not even just checked out. It's missing. Somebody walked away with this book. Um, but I still want it because when the library gets copy back, I want it. Um, so I told it uh, to place a hold. So what's going to happen is I'm not going to get an email from the library saying it's ready until the library replaces the missing book and then catalogs a new copy and then puts it into the system. So in this case, I could be waiting a little bit of a long time. But if this were just regularly checked out, like I bet this one is... This one's just checked out to somebody. Um, if I place a hold on this one, oh, that one's missing too. I'm so, I shouldn't have picked young adult graphic novels. They disappear all the time. Um, there we go. Okay, so this is just regular checked out. So if I place a hold on this, what it's going to do is. Um, it basically puts me in line for it. So again, if I go up here and I look at my holds, so I've gone back to my account mm -hmm. items on hold, and it's telling me I'm waiting for this particular item, I'm first on the list. Um, so when that's returned, I'm going to be notified. I'm just going to cancel these so they don't actually fulfill these. Does that answer your hold questions about how that works? So if you place a hold on something that's checked out to somebody, mm -hmm. um, you're just on the list, and depending on how popular your item is, it might you might see place in queue number five or something like that. Now, the other interesting thing is if it's a book that we have multiple copies of, with the, you know, particularly if it's you know the bestseller, the book that everybody's reading. Um, about this a little bit more because I hadn't thought about this before, but this is a good example. Um, so the book Educated was very popular, so we have 10, we bought 10 copies for the library. Also I have the audiobook, and we also have a large print book. So there's 12 different ways you can get this book. Um, if I just want the large print book, I can place the large print on hold. Pretty straightforward, just one click. You'll notice that those buttons don't show up down here because I need to tell it, do I want the audiobook or do I want the print book? Um, so what I've done is I've clicked on the picture to open up the more details page. And now here it's showing me the audiobook, which is telling me is available now. It's just on the shelf. I can place a hold on that. The librarian will look at it. They'll send me an email when it's ready. Um, or I can um, place a hold specifically on the book, the print book. And then, uh, in this case, there is one copy on the shelf, and I can get that. So um, if I do that, you'll notice here, by default, reserve any items is checked off. So what's nice is you can see all these ones are checked out, but the system doesn't worry about that. It's just going to tell the library, go get one of the available ones for this person. So it will actually tell it to go get it right away. Um, but it, let's say all of these were checked out, um, you know, you would get put on the list, but not on the list for a particular copy, on the list for just whichever next one comes available. So. All right. Great. Any other holds questions? Oh, 
Oh, let me talk about my reading list here. Um, I'll go back to my New York Brown. So, um, oops, I need to be more specific here. So if I save to my list, my reading list, um, now what I clicked on save to list here, and it's asking me, you know, you can make as many lists as you want. You can have, uh, and in this case, I've created my list of history books that I want to read, but if this were a novel, I could say, you know, a novel list, or I could make a new book list that I want to read. You can name it whatever you want. In this case, I've already got a history book list here, but I'm going to I'm actually going to this is my New York books list. I'm going to make a new list. And then what I've done is I can go here and I can go way down to the bottom here, your lists. And in this case, um, I've got my lists here. And in my New York list, I've got this particular item, which I've added. And now when I'm ready for it, when I want to read it, I can do... Um, hold, and that way it will just put it on hold. I have all the information about it here. Um, and if I decide I no longer want to read it, I could just delete it. And then I've also created a second list here of other books that I want to read. So you, you, know, you can get really detailed with all your different lists, or you can just have one list. You can just have one yeah. my reading list and name it whatever you want, and you can keep track. So basically this is kind of like the lowest stakes way of doing it. You're not putting anything Whole, you're just keeping track. I'll go, yeah, I want to remember that later. And um, I have like that under my notes on my phone. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like people it, have the, told me to read. Yeah, it's the but same, and same look at every thought. Yeah. I don't think I'd ever put it on that. All right, yeah. good. All right, so um, let's say I do a search, I know exactly what I'm looking for. I am looking for a book by Jill Lepore called This America. Oh, I think you know, I, I'm sorry. That was a bad example because we have that one. <laughs> um, let me think of a book we don't have right now. Uh, okay. I know specifically I want that book, that author, that title, and we don't have it. So what do I do? Uh, we didn't have the book I wanted. What do I do? So the good news is we can probably get it for you. The bad news is there's no way in the catalog to indicate to the library that I want this book that you don't have. What you do is you go back to kellogcoveredlibrary.org and you click use this library, interlibrary. Um, and all you have to do is there's this little form down here. You put in your name, you put in how you want to be contacted, email or phone. And then you tell it, is it a book, is it a DVD, is it an audio book, etc. And then you put the title and author in and you click send, and that puts your interlibrary loan request in. So, if you're doing searches in the catalog and you're just getting nothing, um, you know, it could mean that, well, it's gonna mean that the library doesn't own it, but we have interlibrary loan service, we can try to find another library for you, and that would be one way to do that. Now, um, one thing to keep in mind with all of that is that new books, um, you know, we, unfortunately, it's, it's rare that we're adding a book into our system the day it's published. It's just the way that we have to order books so that we can get a discount on books, so that we can get more books, so we're not spending all of our money paying bookstore prices on books, means that we have to order them and they have to be shipped to us and then they have to go through the cataloging process. It just takes us a little while longer than a bookstore would to, to get the book on our shelves. So you may know, oh, the new Michael Conley came out today, but I don't see it we're probably going to order it because it's a major author. But um, you could still do the interlibrary loan request. You'll probably just hear back from us to say, oh, you know, we're actually ordering a copy of that already. So we'll push on the holes list for it. But um, new books aren't going to show up right away on our catalog. It just takes us a little while to get a new book into our system. So 
so the interlibrary loan, what libraries are involved in that? Yeah, so it's all the public libraries in the state of Vermont. Vermont. And then um, that's our primary resource. Okay. Also most of the school libraries as well. Um, unfortunately, most of the university libraries, particularly the big ones in the state, yeah. don't, don't send to us, but some of the small ones will. Um, and then we have the option sometimes to look out of state. So if it's something a bit more esoteric, or if it's something, you know, uh, a book on uh, Maryland history that only a library in Maryland is likely to have, um, we can sometimes go out of, out of state and see if they'll send it to us. That's less common, but generally speaking, um, you know, if it's a, something that's in a public library in the state of Vermont, we can probably get it. That being said, when we send a request to the library in Fairfax or wherever, and we say, you know, could you please send us this book? Do you have somebody who wants to check it out here? They can always say no. And they might have a million different reasons as to say why. Their own patron wants to check it out, or it's a rare book and they don't want it to leave their building, or whatever. But that all being said, those are like the reasons we wouldn't be able to get something. In general, we can get a lot of stuff through interlibrary loan, and it's it, we, it's a um, something that a lot of people use here. And it's a great resource, so um, definitely use it. Yeah. Okay. So that's all of the things that I wanted to talk about tonight. Does anybody have any questions? Good. It's pretty clear. Yeah, it's a lot to digest. I and see. it's fun to, to play. <laughs> that's the thing. Play around with it because that's the best way to learn it. Um, you know, do your searches, add things to lists, put things on hold. You know, um, there's no, you can put something on hold and then not pick it up. That's not going to really bother us that much. You know, <laughs> it might bother someone who wants to check it out, but, you know, feel free to, to, to play around with it and, and you know, um, see how it works for you. Um, uh, yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, when, you're, when you want a book, say, um, does, does this catalog have any information about the order of books in, oh, in a question. series? Yeah. Or do you have to go on the internet for that separately? Or? The answer is, in most cases, yes. Like, for instance, Jacqueline Winchester. Uh, okay. No, that was a good example. Uh, that was a good Penny example. is a good one too. Uh, but um, yeah, just um, I was looking at her things the other day, and I was thinking, now did I read this one, or was there one before I this so. that I missed? You know, kind of that idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Great. So Jacqueline Winspear. Uh, see, so you're here. It's a series. Maisie Dobbs book eight. So oh. this is book number eight in the Maisie Dobbs series. So that's where that information is. Kept. I see. How do they, when you like did that, um, how does the library list them? They don't in order, any specific yeah, so, order? So all that I did was search for the author. Yeah. And the way it's listing them, see under here, sort. Uh -huh. It's sorting, in this case, by relevance, which oh. is not helpful. Um, but it's actually sorting by title, because all of these books are relevant. They're all by Jack Um And then um, that's how it's sorting it. So that's why A Lesson came up first. Um, can I do it? Uh, huh. um, so, but this isn't necessarily the order of the thing. It's not the order of the books. <coughs> right. Um, the way, that's a great question. Can I sort it by order of series? I don't know. So I'll tell you what I use when I'm at the circulation desk. And this would require opening a different website, mm -hmm. but there's a website called fantasticfiction.com. Fantastic Fiction. And I use this all the time. And when you search an author, It lays it all out right in order. Oh. oh. And, um, and you can, okay. So then I could take the information and say, oh, I'm on number six, and then I can go back into the catalog and specifically find that one. And can you, when you go into one of those, can you get a little synopsis like, 
you know, to tell you, oh, did I read this? I yeah, remember. for sure, absolutely. You know, uh, so um, if you, so, uh, I'm sorry, let me do this lower here. So I'm going to either click on the eye to view details, or I'm just going to click on the, the picture. Uh -huh. And then, um, and that'll give you the little once I'm in it, um, there's usually a note that's going to have a summation of the book here. Yeah. And then also down here under this more about this title, right. it will give me a summary. This is usually provided by the publisher, which mm -hmm. is handy. Um, or in this case, it's by a, a reviewer who wrote that. Um, so definitely that information is in here. Great, yeah. thank you. You might not find that for a particularly older book, just because the older book is going to have an older catalog record where they weren't adding that kind of information in. So if you're looking for like a historical book that hasn't been published since 1960, whatever, um, it might not be in there. But generally speaking, that information is going to be in there, particularly for like a novel or something like that. And when they say where to find the book, mm -hmm. um, if it's like mystery, will it say mystery under so the it's, last name? Or, so, or so, how does it? Yeah, let me, let me, so the call number is going to be the most useful information. So in that case, M oh, for mystery. M is for mystery, and then now, M is for when this information is correct, when it doesn't say anything about being at a desk, it's correct. Oh. Because that's only about being at a desk, it's incorrect. Oh, I see. But in this yeah. case, it's telling you this all information is correct. It's at the Kellogg Cupboard Library, it's in the adult section of the library, and it's in the mystery right. section. Right, okay. That's all correct. If it says something to be reviewed, that's not correct. And, okay. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of books have that information right now, and like I said, we have to fix all of that. That yeah. will take a little bit of time on our end. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.